What's the most shocking movie of all time? If you were to look it up on Google, you would see many films that come up rather often, the majority of which are rather similar in how they present their content. Very disturbing, very intense, very serious. Serbian film, August Underground, Solo. Solo's a beautiful movie. Though. Several others. But the ones that are the most interesting to me are the ones that don't take themselves so seriously. The ones that are shocking in more of a darkly comedic way. There's one movie, or I guess an entire filmography, I should say, that stands out from the crowd in this regard. That is the filmography of John Waters. A Baltimore native, John Waters was born in 1946. He started making his films at the age of 18, after he was kicked out of NYU for being caught smoking pot on campus. His very early short films are currently unavailable to the public, the first of which was 1964's A Hag in a Black Leather Jacket, which was followed up by Roman Candles in 1966 and a year makeup in 1968. All of these were shorts, and from what we know about them, it's clear they demonstrated his very unique and polarizing style that he would go on to be known for in his later work. He was a very transgressive and offensive filmmaker, including very taboo and politically incorrect subject matter in his movies. This alienated a lot of people from his films, however he continued to flourish in the ever-growing underground cult film scene. His first ever feature-length film was released in 1969. The film starred Divine, also known as Harris Milstead, who was a very good friend and prominent collaborator of John Waters. He appeared in many of John's early work under the Divine persona persona that would go on to garner him much success even outside of John's work, with an over-the-top hyper-feminine style and a very vulgar and obscene persona. This vulgarity and obscenity was often leaned into in Divine's appearances in John Waters' early work. Some other of John's frequent collaborators would make their first appearances in this film, including Mary Vivian Pierce, Mink Stoll, and David Lockery. These actors, along with several others who would appear in later films from John, would be coined as Dreamlanders. While Mondo Trasho certainly showcases many elements of Waters' trademark style on full display, it is also rather primitive. Sure, the film features plenty of violence, gore, fetishes, and general cultural indecency, however, it doesn't stand out with eye-popping colors, strange surreal set design, and oddly dry, almost unsettling dialogue. The year 1970 would mark a much more cohesive and distinctly John waters e work known as Multiple Maniacs. Multiple Maniacs is a very good introduction to John Waters' style and overall filmography being a perfect demonstration of what he's known for. The film follows Divine, who operates a traveling roadside freak show-like attraction. At the end of every show, Divine comes out and robs the audience at gunpoint. This setup already showcases what John Waters' films are all about. It takes a piece of traditional Americana that everyone who grew up in America has some kind of experience with. In this case, it sexually perverts it, as well as perverts it with the concept of theft and violence. The taboos within this film don't stop there though. We get murder, rape, drug use, religious imagery, more murder, cannibalism, and ending it off with even more murder. It showcases very intense and upsetting things on full display, but it does so in such an absurd and surrealist way that you can't help but enjoy yourself while watching. John Waters approaches the worlds he crafts in such a strange and over-the-top way. To get a better feel for this, let's move on to the next film in his filmography, Pink Flamingos. Released in 1972, Pink Flamingos is much like many of John Waters' other films, following two groups of people, the Divine Family and the Marbles, who both compete to win the title of Filthiest Person Alive. There is a brand new aspect added to the film that enhances its John Waters-ness, and that is the addition of very vibrant and eye-popping colors that only add to the strange and surreal world that John Waters builds. Pink Flamingos is also John Waters' most iconic film even still, for how shocking it is but also for how iconic much of the scenes and dialogue in the film are. Scenes in the movie still get shared around and talked about today, such as Divine's speech when talking about her politics, the whistling butthole scene, or the infamous final scene where Divine actually eats fecal matter. Fecal matter from a dog, but still real, actual fecal matter shown on screen being consumed by a person. Scenes like this really show how dedicated these actors were to what they were making. They weren't afraid to embarrass themselves or do a multitude of crazy and insane and disgusting things to themselves. Mink Stoll was about to set her hair on fire for the movie. 
before she decided it probably wasn't the best idea at the last minute. This strange, scrappy bunch of complete weirdos and lunatics were so utterly dedicated to their craft of making these insane exercises and poor tastes, as they call them. That dedication is also why many people connected to these films and continue to watch them today, despite their very infamous reputation. I saw pink flamingos. You what? They didn't phone it in, and they truly went all out to make their messed up dreams a reality. Pink Flamingos steadily grew in popularity as a midnight film and a true piece of shock value to go and watch and behold how truly messed up it was. This film's infamy elevated it to an almost cult status and sequentially elevated John Waters himself to a cult status as well. John Waters will continue to only grow in popularity after the release of Pink Flamingos, leading to him getting more filmmaking opportunities. John Waters' more traditional fare with 1974's Female Trouble and 1977's Desperate Living, which both have their fair share of iconic moments and are considered by many diehard John Waters fans to be some of his best work, John Waters would release his 1981 film, Polyester, which began to mark his breakthrough to the mainstream. With a still small budget of $300,000, it would be produced by an actual production company this time, New Line Cinema and would star more well-known actors, as well as original Dreamlanders, and would even be released in real, actual theaters as a mainstream comedy and would gross $1 million upon its first release. This is no doubt somewhat due to it being the first of Waters' works to not be rated X, instead getting the more acceptable R rating, which allowed it to be seen by more people and released in more theaters. This is not to say the film completely loses its traditional John Waters edge, it still takes place in a weird perverted version of classic Americana, contains a lot of drug use, teenage pregnancies, and loads of other taboo topics. It's still very much in poor taste, but tones down the extreme sexual and violent nature quite a bit. In 1988, he would release his biggest budget and most mainstream film yet, Hairspray. It's the only one of his films that really has gone on to live on a life of its own outside of the usual degenerate crowd that would be interested in a John Waters movie, and has been the basis for many adaptations that are even more well known than the original. After Hairspray, his movies would only get bigger and bigger with larger scales, budgets, and casts. He would work with actors like Johnny Depp, Willem Dafoe, Iggy Pop, Kathleen Turner, Matthew Lillard, Maggie Gyllenhaal, Stina Ricci, and Johnny Knoxville. He would never fully sell out though with all of his movies continuing to take place in Baltimore, and many of them focusing on strange and unusual characters who all engage in many taboo topics. 2000's Cecil B. Demented would even be an homage of sorts to his early style of filmmaking, focusing on a band of misfit filmmakers from the Baltimore area. In 2004, John Waters would release his last film, A Dirty Shame. It would feature his largest budget yet of $15 million, and quite fittingly, it would sport an NC-17 rating, which was the replacement for the X rating. It would be his first to have such a rating since 1977's Desperate Living. This rating caused it to not do so well, but despite his budget steadily increasing and his films becoming more mainstream, he never forgot his roots and he never forgot his mission statement of trading exercises in poor taste. His films, despite how strange they were, have practically become part of the DNA of Baltimore, Maryland, and I think you could even say they've become a DNA of independent filmmaking as a whole. John Waters films, along with several other cult movies, showed young people with aspirations of being an artist so you don't need a film degree, or loads of money, or even some super interesting story. All you need is passion, and a camera. A passion for whatever, be it accepted by society, or not. John Waters made films that seemed to be so utterly disgusting, and so irredeemable, that no one would ever want to watch them. But people did. A lot of people, and now two of his movies are in the National Film Registry. Four of his films are in the Criterion Collection. One of his films has spawned a massively successful musical. People still watch and care about these filthy and disgusting movies even 50 years after they were made. No matter how niche or strange or taboo what you make it, there will always be an audience for it. So follow in John Waters' footsteps. So I miss perverts in the real world. I miss seeing them. Make what you want and make what you care about even if it is disgusting and apprehensible. It still will likely not be able to hold a candle to the early works of the one, the only, John Waters. Thank you for watching, and thank you for a thousand views on my last video. I really appreciate it.